Hello, and welcome to today's discussion with five pioneer Stanford women faculty. All of us came to Stanford in the late 1960s or early 70s, a time when women faculty were a true rarity in American higher education. Indeed, a Stanford study showed that in 1969, women were less than 5% of all tenure track faculty at Stanford and only 2% of full professors. Most of us here today were the first women hired in our respective departments, and we made our way amidst male faculty not used to having women colleagues and male students not used to women professors. I'm Myra Strober, Professor Emerita from both the Stanford Graduate School of Education and the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. Although there was little progress in hiring women faculty at Stanford in the 50s and 60s, a great deal of change started occurring on college campuses in the late 60s and early 70s with the free speech movement and student protests. Students were protesting not only the draft and the war in Vietnam, but also the lack of equal rights for black Americans, gays, and women. The women you will meet today lived through these tumultuous times, which made our experiences different from the women hired a decade earlier. And now I'd like to introduce our participants. To my left is Helen Quinn, SLAC Professor Emerita of Particle Physics and Astrophysics. In 1973, Helen was appointed Assistant Professor of Physics at Harvard. Although soon promoted to Associate Professor, she moved to the Bay Area in 1976 because of her husband's job. The next year, she was hired as a staff scientist at SLAC, a national high energy physics laboratory at Stanford. Helen remained as a staff researcher at SLAC for 26 years, during which time she earned a major international scientific award, was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, and was elected president of the 40,000 member American Physical Society. She was promoted to the position of SLAC professor in 2003. In recent years, her interests have turned to science education for K 12th grade students. She chaired a national commission that recommended a new approach for teaching science, which has been adopted by schools in more than 18 states in the US. Next to Helen is Elizabeth Traugott. Professor Emerita of Linguistics and Professor Emerita of English. In 1964, Elizabeth was appointed Assistant Professor of English at the University of California, Berkeley. Four years later, she married a professor in her department. But because of nepotism rules in those days, prohibiting husbands and wives from working in the same department, she came to Stanford as a part-time lecturer of linguistics and English. Elizabeth was promoted to Associate Professor of Linguistics and English at Stanford in 1970, and later co-founded Stanford's new Department of Linguistics. She served as Chair of Linguistics for five years, and then in 1985, she became one of Stanford's highest ranking female administrators when she was appointed Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Studies. Next is Carolyn Lugie. Professor Emerita in the History Department. Carolyn was the first woman faculty member hired in Stanford's History Department since the 1890s. She was the first woman to get tenure in the department, the first woman to chair the department, and only the second woman in the department to be awarded an endowed chair. Carolyn pioneered the use of information technology and quantitative social history methods in her scholarly work which focused on European history, especially in France. In the 1980s, she was instrumental in reforming Stanford's undergraduate curriculum in ways that were controversial at the time, but later adopted by most universities in America. She became a senior academic leader at Stanford, serving as chair of Stanford's faculty senate, senior associate dean in the School of Humanities and Sciences, and dean of undergraduate studies. At the opposite end of the table is Sarah Donaldson, a professor of radiation oncology at Stanford and chief of radiation oncology service at the Stanford Hospital Clinics and at the Packard Children's Hospital. Sarah started out as a nurse, earning the Oregon Nurse of the Year Award. 
Her supervisor at that time, a doctor who became a lifelong mentor, urged her to go to medical school. So she did, finishing her MD at Harvard in 1968. In 1973, she joined the Stanford faculty in radiation oncology, where she founded the Pediatric Oncology Program at a time when pediatric oncology wasn't yet a known field. Still on active duty as an endowed professor, Sarah served as the first woman president of the American Board of Radiology and the first woman president of the American Society of Radiation Oncology. And now a little bit about my own background. I'm a labor economist, and in 1972, I was the first woman faculty member to be hired by the Stanford Graduate School of Business. My research and consulting has focused on gender issues in the workplace and work and family, and I was the founding director of Stanford Center for Research on Women, now the Clayman Institute for Gender Research. I was turned down for promotion and tenure at the business school in 1977 and moved over to Stanford's Graduate School of Education, where I later became full professor, associate dean, and acting dean. I was one of the founders of the new field of feminist economics and served as president of the International Association for Feminist Economics. Although I'm now officially retired, I continue to teach a popular course at the Graduate School of Business on work and family, where 40% of my students are now men. <laughs> I want to start by asking you about how you came to your careers. You've all had extremely distinguished careers as Stanford professors. And now, as you look back, what do you think was the single most important influence on your choice of field, of your choice of coming to Stanford, or going into academia? How, how did that play out for you? Well, I can answer that, Myra. Let me start by saying, in my case, I had a strong mother. And she instilled in me the uh, work ethic of one of being self-sufficient and being independent and always being able to take care of myself. But when I aspired to uh, go on to school and think a little bit out of the box into avenues that weren't commonly entered by young women, uh, she was um, overly protective, in my opinion. At the time, it was the pathway for young women that wanted to, wanted to go on and uh, take care of themselves and be successful to go on any one of three pathways, but they were to become a secretary, to become a teacher, or to become a nurse. Mm -hmm. And I picked the nursing pathway, and it was terrific. And I think my mother was very proud that I did that. But when I then started talking about going on to graduate school or going to medical school, she was um, hesitant for me to enter into something, into a man's world in which I might not succeed or I might encounter unhappinesses or, or, or situations that would be uncomfortable for me. So I didn't get a lot of encouragement from my family. But I did get encouragement from a mentor, and it happened to be the person I was working for, my employer. He was a powerful mentor. And he introduced to me areas uh, about life that I didn't know, which was life beyond Portland, Oregon as a nurse. It was, um, and it was very, very influential to me to, to listen to a powerful mentor and, uh, and to begin to follow that advice. And how about coming to Stanford? My mentor continued to be my mentor all throughout my professional career. And it was my mentor that encouraged me to, uh, to come to Stanford as well. Because at that time, after I finished medical school, and I was interested in um, doing cancer, can being a cancer doctor, a cancer investigator, a cancer teacher, a cancer practitioner, uh, I, I needed some direction on how to do that. And the field of oncology wasn't developed at that time. So I asked my mentor's advice. And he was a cancer surgeon. And he very wisely said, you know, Sarah, you ought to think about radiation oncology, something I didn't know anything about. There was no clerkship at it at Harvard Medical School. It was totally um, unknown to me. And he said, you know, you ought to go down and talk to my friend Mal Bagshaw. Mal Bagshaw was a professor of radiation oncology at the time. And, it was, and Stanford had a very, very strong radiation oncology department. So it was my surgeon mentor 
that actually encouraged me to come down to Stanford. Very wise man, and he, um, he opened many, many doors for me. How about you, Helen? How did you get into hey. physics? Well, <laughs> you know, coming to the U.S., I, I grew up in Australia, and my family moved to the U.S. when I had completed two years at Melbourne University. And I transferred to Stanford with three years of credit, so I arrived here as a senior, but without a major. And I had to find something I could finish in one year. And so I was sent around with my notes from my courses in, in Melbourne to various departments, science and math, because I'd been in the science area more generally. And one professor in the professor whom I was sent to in the physics department was the person who said, well, looks as if you could complete a physics major in a year. Why don't you go audit some courses, figure out where you belong. If you think you've had it, I'll say you've had it. If you think you need it, you should take it. And so he gave me the flexibility to place myself. I arrived sort of in the middle of spring, of winter quarter. And so I was going to register for classes in spring quarter, and I had that half a quarter to figure out where I belonged. And if physics as a major was going to work out for me as something I could complete, in the year and a quarter, I would be an undergraduate. And that worked out. So it was really the flexibility of that professor about requirements, which was a big contrast. I, I also applied to Berkeley, and I went to Berkeley. And at Berkeley, they tried to make one-to-one -one correspondences between the courses I'd taken and the courses they were going to give me credit for in some bureaucratic office. And so my credit would have been a whole lot less. So it was simply the flexibility to move into that major with the courses I'd taken was what worked for me. So physics was a male-dominated field. It was. This man, Jerry Pines was his name, was an assistant professor. He also later went into an area of education and then into biophysics. But I think it was just his personality to be open and, and not very rigid about requirements wow. that made life possible for me. Yes, it was a very male department. I, when I started graduate school the following year, there were no, there was one other woman in my class graduating in, in physics. There was one other woman who entered graduate school with me and lasted about six months and then left. So women were a very small percentage, certainly. Mm -hmm. And there weren't any in the faculty. <laughs> Elizabeth? Well, my story is a little bit different from Sarah's, almost the opposite in some regards. Uh, I came from England, and I had a father who was an academic and a grandfather who was an academic. And I was expected to be academic, and I resisted for quite a while. <laughs> but I decided that I would go about as far away across the universe as I could, and I ended up at the University of California, Berkeley in the English department. And it turned out that I took a few classes just to explore things. Uh, so I got really excited, despite myself, uh, in some New York work that was being done by Noam Chomsky on linguistics. And I realized that I had the opportunity to do something completely new, which was to put together Chomsky and generative syntax, which was very scientific, or pretended to be scientific, uh, with some studies that I'd done of Old English and historical work. So I think I did the first dissertation uh, on combining Chomsky and generative grammar with historical work. And I really enjoyed doing something that nobody had done before. And that's really what started it. My experience was a little bit like Sarah's in that I had an ambivalent family as I, as I went along, my birth family. Um, my father was the biggest influence on me growing up and really uh, taught me to work hard. And he valued my hard work and my accomplishments in, uh, in school and in college. And when I decided to go on after college, that wasn't what they had in mind. <laughs> and 
actually, when I came home from my, PH, my final PhD exam, my father said, well, now I hope you're going to start doing what you're supposed to do, <laughs> which was to be a kind of country club woman. And I, re I, I, I put this out there because I think there's something, there's something similar among faculty men that you come in, 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 in contact with. That is to say, I went to a, a graduate school where there were many uh, graduate women, and they were very well treated with fellowships and so on. But there was one faculty woman, and that she was there because she had a chair which was reserved for a woman, mm -hmm. a woman historian. And she, she. This was at Michigan. This was at Michigan, and she retired when I was a graduate student, and it was so hard for those men. They actually went to court and tried to break the terms of the chair rather than hire a woman. In fact, um, they turned down a woman who came through who be went on to become the, the best historian in America of European history. Um, and, I think, and I think of my father in those terms, you know, that it was, it was great to be, for her to be a good student but to go off and do something beyond their experience or expectation, they were really, it took a long time for them to, to become supportive. Uh, but I did, I went on to um, graduate work, and um, though I had started out in college as a, a prospective chemist, I uh, rediscovered my love of history and went on to graduate school in history, obviously. and. I was really, I'm uh, embarrassed to say, a little bit pushed along because I went there, I wanted to be a teacher. I always wanted to be a teacher. And I thought I would go for a year or so and- I did the same thing. The, and, the, <laughs> and, and then I started having babies and I would have a baby and I would say to the department, um, you know, I think I really, better, I really better stop. And they would say, no, you know, just keep going, just keep going. And it was really my professors and my um, mentors that uh, kept me going long enough that uh, academia was the obvious thing to go into. And they, as we can talk about, um, they were really the ones that got me the job at Stanford, so. Nice, nice story. So we have similar experiences, uh, Sarah, and. Carolyn and Helen and me, well, not so much your parents, but my parents also were not enthusiastic <laughs> about this endeavor. Um, my mother, my mother was a feminist. She never called herself a feminist, yeah. but she always told Good. my sister and me that we had to be independent. And so for me, that meant being a high school social studies teacher. Mm -hmm. And I was on that path. And then it's also interesting, we all had men in our lives that really intervened in important ways because uh, the dean at Cornell called me in to say that I'd been recommended by the faculty for a Woodrow Wilson fellowship and was I thinking about graduate school? And I said, no, I was thinking about getting married. And uh, he said, well, think some more. And eventually, uh, the man that I, uh, my first husband, um, was enthusiastic about my going on. I never did get a Wilson, um, and I had to choose what field to go into because my undergraduate major was in industrial and labor relations, and I knew I didn't want a, a PhD in that. So, you know, my, my parents said this was all okay because my fiance said it was okay, and their primary interest was in my getting married. If he had said no, they would have said no, and probably nothing would have happened. But um, I chose economics not really knowing that it was such a male field. Uh, but I thought history was really too much for me because I didn't realize that historians specialized. So I thought you had to know everything about everything <laughs> from time immemorial. And I didn't think I could do that. So I became an economist. Um, and you know, my first day at the PhD program at MIT, I walked into the classroom and the professors who eventually became my thesis advisor said, 
I think you're in the wrong room, young lady. And I said, well, no. I said, I'm Myra Strober. And he said, oh, you're Myra Strober. He said, well, welcome then. And I thought, <laughs> suddenly, I'm an honorary male. You know, I, I, I'm welcome because he knows who I am. But in general, he thinks I'm in the wrong room. So um, it was hard to, uh, to, and I was the only woman, well, there was one other woman in my program. That's what it was like going to Dartmouth Medical School, too, which had been an all-male school until um, until they admitted women, which was about the time when I was going to medical school. And it was hard being in a class with a few other women, and very, uh, mostly men, because there were not locker rooms, and there weren't even, it's hard to find a bathroom. There were not dormitories. There was not facilities for women students in graduate school. So let's talk a little bit about how we got our first jobs at Stanford. You talked a little bit about it, Sarah. But you know, in those days, um, the old boys network was even more active than it is now. And jobs were not posted. And so um, it'd be interesting to explore how we got our jobs. Well, I'm, I'm fond of saying that I was the first woman on a tenure track in the history department in the modern era. <laughs> uh, and, and the last to be hired in the old boy system. Because mm -hmm. I was hired because they got a job, they had an opening here. Uh, the history department called someone they knew at the University of Chicago who didn't have a student but knew that my mentor at Michigan had a student. And so one day my mentor said to me, have you heard, did you get a call from Stanford? I said, what, what, what are you talking about? And uh, it was all arranged by the time they called me. And that's how the old boy system worked. And so I think that, that we here are really positioned across that transition. Because within a year or two of my coming in 1973, it was mandated that everything was openly advertised and uh, so that everyone would have, have a shot at it and, and interviews and so on. In my case, I got both my job at Harvard and my job here at Stanford were because the people in that department knew me. Mm -hmm. Right At Stanford, I'd done my PhD here. The faculty at Slack knew me very well. And so they went out of the way to find a way to give me a job when I said, I want to come back here. At Harvard, I had met some faculty at a summer school in Europe. And when I walked in to that department without a job, I first just got an office. And I stayed there and worked with them. And then the next year, they had money for a postdoctoral position rather late in the year, and they offered it to me. And because they knew that the, the pool that they usually searched in was already gone. And so then, from that position, I was promoted to assistant professor, again, within the network of people I was already working with. So I think I, I made my way by my own force of personality or whatever it was, my own work, rather than by any outside reputation. Yeah, same with me. I mean, I essentially, uh, Myra mentioned that uh, when I was at Berkeley, I married someone in the same department. That was not OK. It was fine to live together, but it was not all right <laughs> to be married. In the same <laughs> department. Only, only in Berkeley would it be oh, all right to live together, but not get married. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, I was looking for a job, and I, I rode around, and I uh, UC Santa Cruz and Stanford, and I uh, happened to know the then chair of the committee. There was no department when I first came to Stanford. There was a group of people from across the university. There were actually two women who were from the medical school. Hearing and speech sciences had being closed and they were sort of floating around and so there so were two were women in the program but when we get to talk about m being marginal i think they felt very marginal partly because they were in the medical school and not really linguists they were very distinguished in terms of the w clinical work with cochlear implants but w they weren't strictly speaking linguists so they weren't a thought of as really very central members of the committee. Yes, it 
definitely was old boy. Plus, as in Helen's case, you know, some push from my part. So my situation had both the old boy and an old girl network <laughs> involved. <laughs> um, I was a lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley in economics. Um, almost all the women in anywhere in the University of California system at Berkeley and elsewhere were lecturers rather than assistant professors. And they had sued, well not sued, they had filed a complaint with the Labor Department um, thanks to the Women's Equity Action League um, the spring before I came to Berkeley in 1970. And um, so there were investigators all over Berkeley the year I came looking at why women were not on the regular faculty. <clears throat> Stanford had not been sued, but Stanford was afraid of being sued or having um, a complaint filed. And so they began, um, particularly Artie Bienenstock, who was um, vice provost for faculty affairs, and also Bill Miller, who was provost, really began putting pressure on all over the university to hire more women. So at the same time, I met uh, Ruth Franklin at my son's nursery school. She was the wife of a um, law school professor. And she wanted to know, how come I was living in Palo Alto but teaching at Berkeley? And I said, because my thesis advisor didn't know anybody in the economics department at Stanford, but did know someone at Berkeley. And she said, oh, she understood. And I should send her, her my vita. And she would get it to R.J. Miller, who was the dean of the business school. So here's the old girls network. And I asked her, you know, how are you going to do that? Oh, she said, well, she knew another member of the Radcliffe Club in Palo Alto. And that was Rita Ricardo Campbell. And she knew that Rita knew R.J. Miller. <laughs> so I sent Ruth my. Um, Vita. This is back networking over the back fence, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. At the nursery school. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, I got a call from R.J. Miller one night when I was bathing my kids. And my husband knocked on the door and said R.J. was on the phone. And I said, right. And President Nixon wants to talk to me after that. I, I just didn't believe that the business school was calling me. But they hired me. And my appointment was partly old boy network and partly affirmative action. I mean, there was no affirmative action program. But clearly, the business school wanted a woman. And that year, the business school hired not only its first woman, but its first African American, first Asian American, and first Hispanic, all in one year. But then it couldn't promote you all at the same time. <laughs> no, no. They couldn't promote except one. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, so I, I'm an interesting case also <laughs> where the kind of social change that I was talking about in the introduction affected Stanford and certainly affected me. So I just wonder whether you think any of the social changes that were going on at the time affected you or whether you, know, you were a feminist when you came to Stanford or you became a feminist while you were here. And you know, th those were times, the early 1970s, of such ferment, mm -hmm. uh, not only in the country and the world at large, but also um, right here at the university. Well, I certainly thought I was a feminist. Uh, but not the standard UC Berkeley English department type feminist, because sometimes one has a real no, moment of experience, and a young woman who was also a doctoral student in the English department, one day, somewhere around, I don't know when exactly, probably 67 or something. Uh, well, actually, that was past, I already was teaching, but I think she was a student. She said, aren't you sorry you're not a man? And a light <laughs> went off in my head. No, I'm not at all sorry. <laughs> Thank you. But it was this sense of the time that somehow one wasn't going to succeed if one wasn't a man. That was really destroying her in a way. I mean, she was just so concerned about it, she wanted to be part of the male world. And uh, you know, there are eureka moments, or not eureka moments, but moments of 
self-discovery when someone says something to you like that. Yes, I'm a feminist, but <laughs> and I want to be a woman, and I want to be my own person. And I'm fine being me, essentially. I think I was that. not a feminist, and I think in the physics world, you know, one can take on so many things. I was taking on raising a family and being a physicist. And going beyond that at that time in my career was not thinkable. Right? I, could, I could pursue my physics, and I could pursue raising my kids, but I couldn't take on fighting another set of battles within a place, Slack, which was still into the 70s, a totally male-dominated mm -hmm. community, and really didn't think in terms of social issues at all until much later, I'd say. In a way, I think I was always a feminist <laughs> uh, growing up. Uh, I had a very high consciousness of, of being a girl and had a lot of uh, girlfriends. I went to a women's college where we talked about women in their, their roles and their opportunities all the time. Um, but again, going back to what I said before, there was, there was something of a misunderstood message. I mean, I took the message to be the world is open to you and you go for it as a woman. You went to Smith? To Smith. Mm -hmm. And I gradually realized we had a male president <laughs> with whom I wrote my senior thesis. Uh, that wasn't the message. And I figured that out when I read Betty Friedan, who, who came out, whose book came out, The Feminine Mystique, came out the year I graduated. And that was about Smith, um, about the the, the purpose of those colleges to educate uh, wise wives and mothers. But anyway, I didn't take that message. I misunderstood it. <laughs> and, um, but then, you know, through the 60s, uh, I, had, I had my hands full w with family and so on, but I did get involved in feminist action. And one of the things I was most active in was trying to get the newspapers, and you'll remember this, to stop listing help wanted female, help wanted male. Remember that? Oh, yes. And um, uh, employment agencies would have pink cards and blue cards when you went, when you went in <laughs> to look for a job. Um, so I met with many uh, newspaper publishers <laughs> to get them. I mean, I was so naive. I thought I would just walk in because there, it was then the law not to discriminate. I forget which title that was, but it, it came out in the early 70s. And there wasn't supposed to be discrimination in employment. And I just went in to tell them, thinking that <laughs> the, law would, <laughs> you know, the law would apply itself. And, and that's when I learned that y you have to go step by step over a, a long period of time in, in different kinds of action to get what really needs to be done. What's your experience, well, Sarah? Well, I was not a feminist, <laughs> but I profited from those women, perhaps the women in the decade ahead of our group, those women who really did fight the anti-discrimination battles. Because when I came into medicine, there were very few women. Um, there were very few role models. I was the only woman in my department. and. The expectation was very much that if you are going to take the place of a male in medical school or in residency or on the faculty, if you're going to enter a man's world, you do a man's job. And those were the expectations. So there was no playing a feminist card. You do a man's job. And in my department with powerful mentors, Henry Kaplan and Malcolm Bagshaw, both of whom had wives who had professions and were highly respected women, I think they were sensitive to that for me, but they set a very high bar of scientific excellence and contribution and such, and they both gave 110%. And so the expectation was that if you were going to be in their department, you too would give 110%. And so didn't dream of me to do anything other than pour my entire life into my job and to do that. And I got many, many opportunities from Kaplan and Bagshaw and from throughout Stanford, because is now becoming aware of equal opportunity and putting women on committees and such. So 
if anything, I profited from being a woman at a time when the pool was so small that if you did a good job, you got asked twice to do it again. And so I think that... In fact, we all got probably more than our share of committee work, right? Uh, well, uh, I, I did it. In professional societies, in, in departments, yeah. everybody wanted a woman and there were few of us. So clearly, I think we, we moved forward in that kind of work earlier than the men in the same path. That for me, that happened all the way through my Stanford journey and then uh, through leadership positions thereafter because, as we all know, there are very few women in leadership today. And so if you happen to be on that track or if you are recognized for doing a job and you actually give 110% instead of 110, you get asked to do it again. And so if when, there are very, when the competition is small, when the pool is small, and when the awareness is high of uh, non-discrimination, many, many, many doors become open for you. And women learn how to multitask. We're probably better at it than men are. And we learn how to balance a lot of things. And it's a matter of setting priorities and getting the job done. But Myra, you were doing feminist scholarship. Did that, ma did that make a difference? In, in yes, I think it did make a difference. Um, I think, um, huh. I mean, the, the business school when I got here was so male. <laughs> Um, there was another woman hired the year I was hired too, uh, Francine Gordon, and so we used to say um, there were 90 men in us, mm -hmm. and there were five women students out of 350 in the class, so it was a very male place. And I was already doing scholarship on women's employment when I was hired by the business school, so they knew what I was doing, but it didn't quite register for them. <laughs> so the first seminar I gave when I came to the business school was on the economics of childcare. And I never got through the first five minutes of my seminar because as soon as they heard these 15 white male economists that I was um, proposing subsidies for childcare, they attacked me on, on the chair of the session, never intervened, and so they just you know, attacked me for 50 minutes, and then, blessedly, it was over. Um, so after that, several of them came to my office to advise me to uh, stop doing research on women and do mainstream stuff. Do and, real research. And then one of them told me, you know, after you get tenure, you can do whatever the hell you want, but for now, you know, you stick to mainstream stuff. And I thought to myself, I'm not doing it because I'm interested in the economics of childcare and the economics of women's work and um, how you value unpaid labor in the home. And I'm not going to do mainstream work. And so, you know, I was further and further alienated from my colleagues at the business school. And I think one of the reasons I started Stanford's Center for Research on Women was that I was so alienated at the business school. Um, I had not a single person I could talk to about what I was interested in, unlike your situation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I started to do f what became feminist research. I became a charter member of the Committee on the Status of Women in the Economics Profession. And then when it came time for tenure, um, they said, bye-bye. Uh, we, don't, we don't really want you here. You can't be a member of our club. I mean, they didn't say that, but mm -hmm. what they did say was that two male metaphors in a single interview. They said, first of all, I hadn't hit a home run, and secondly, um, my work was not seminal, which I thought was oh. very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked them for feedback about the letters. They had gotten, I don't know, 12 or 14 letters. Um, and I wanted to know what the letters said. I didn't want to know who sent the letters. I just wanted to know what the letters said. And so I asked them to redact the names and any other identifying information. And instead of that, they gave me a small envelope filled with sentences. They had cut up the letters cut into <laughs> sentences. They didn't paste anything. They just <laughs> gave me the, the sentences. Little strips. And um, you know, I felt that my work had been trashed and cut up, and um, it was a very, Impressive. very unpleasant situation. Um, what year was that? Situation. 1977. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. so you were in the situation of having a 
of working on a field and pioneering a field which was considered marginal at the time. Worse than marginal. Well, worse than marginal. After all, I was prom time. promoting a subsidy for child care, which was uh, Not good economics. against their religion. So um, I was definitely persona non grata. Myra's description of her experience in the business school at the same time when I was getting started in the history department brings to mind the way there were many Stanfords at this point. The, the experience really differed widely, even more widely than I think it continues to uh, differ from school to school, from department to department. And my own experience in the history department was that I, my acceptance was, was very, very strong. And I never had any sense that uh, anybody ha had any other intention for me than to give me a full shot, a full shot at tenure. And I think one of the reasons for that, I've always thought that one of the reasons uh, why that worked in the department was that each assistant professor had his or her own tenure line. And all you had to do, I mean, what you had to do was fulfill the expectations for t tenure in your research, in your teaching, and you were not competing against anyone else for a position in the department. So it was a very non-competitive situation and uh, a fairly, fairly comfortable one in, in those respects for me. And I was in the strongest part of the department, the European History Department, which was filled with giants. Uh, and they were helpful to me. They were support, very supportive to me, which does not mean that it was easy. <laughs> it was not easy. I brought some of my own problems with me. Uh, I was under a lot of stress not to fail because I felt that there wasn't going to be another woman's appointment if, if I didn't succeed. Um, I was unable to show any kind of weakness. You know, it, it, was, it was terrifying to think that I would show any kind, any kind of weakness. Um, I suffered from the imposter complex, <laughs> which was this, this fear that if they just found out that you, you know, who, who, what, you, what you really knew, <laughs> they'd find out that you were an imposter uh, mm -hmm. in the position that they had, that they had uh, offered you. Uh, that's very common for women in, in professional work and probably in, uh, in other things. I had two other um, advantages in the history department, two other sources of support for me that were immensely helpful to me. And one was the graduate students. Uh, it was my first job, you know, I, was, I wasn't any older than they were, uh, than some of them were, and they were, they were fans of mine and they were advisors cueing me into, you know, how things were done in the department. And the other source was the office staff, and I always have gratitude to them. Those were, were of course, all women. Uh, there were five of them. and. Several of them were Stanford grads, and so they had gone this pathway, which was, you know, you get a Stanford degree and you become a, a secretary. And they really took me under their wing and told me a lot about how things were done in the department and who was who, and it, that was immensely helpful. And, and both of those were my, my uh, sort of old, old, young girl network or, or old girl network. But it made a big difference in the department. And I imagine if the, the, the rest of us speak, that will be borne out, that it was very, very different in different sectors of the university. And I think there's another sector, which is the gatekeepers in the dean's office. Because sometimes one could be very successful in the department, and then the deans would say, mm -hmm. Mm, this is a bit marginal. We do not understand this kind of work as having any serious import. And this, there, the kind of attitude that Myra was talking about. You were creating a new field at the same time you were coming fields. along as a woman. So You're creating new fields, and we haven't heard of this, and how can we compare you? 
how can we say you're one of the 10 best when there aren't 10 people around to compare you with? <laughs> and I think that that's an, a very important other side of Stanford. And they rightly have, I mean, of course one has to have gatekeepers. But gatekeepers have to understand that the field expands and there are different things going on. And, to be more flexible, I think, in their value system. And the other discourse in, in the dean's office was always, well, affirmative action, we're going for lesser quality. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and, you know, the threat the that fear. Diversif the, the, the fear that diversifying the faculty was going to mean lowering uh, the quality. And it took a while to get through that. But that was a very active discussion always when I was in the dean's office. And there were a lot of younger faculty who felt that they must be regarded as of second mm. degree quality because they were so-called affirmative action Yes. Appoint appointees, it was a major problem. Yeah, it could be very damaging. It could be one. very it's difficult to feel that you've come difficult. in under that mm -hmm. cloud, in effect. Yeah. For me, I think the difference was I was not tenure track. I was staff. And so when the opportunity to hire a faculty member in my group at Slack came up, I assumed I, I applied as a candidate. And I don't think I was even considered because they knew I wasn't going to leave, so why should they give me the billet? They could bring in somebody new. And once that appointment was made, I realized you know, that was my situation. I was not going to be promoted. And so I either had to make my peace with that or look for positions elsewhere or think about how else I was going to do it. And I made a conscious decision that you know, it really didn't matter in the day-to-day -day operation of the group and the work I was doing because we were not a Stanford department, we were a research lab. And so I was as much part of the research group as anybody. And so I decided just to forget about that. And so it wasn't until much later that the option came up again. I think this is so interesting because in the School of Medicine, my story is very similar to yours, Carolyn. And and the thing I resonate about what you had to say is that, at least in the School of Medicine, when there were no other women who were ahead of me and therefore to learn from, you, you, learn, you learn very quickly how to network. And the people that helped me traverse my, the waters and figure out how to survive in the hospital or in the department or were the nurses in the hospital, and I was one of them, I could talk to them, mm -hmm the secretaries, the staff that actually knew what was going on. And so women network with women. And I did that in spades. They were extremely helpful to me. At the same time, I had this bar that was set by the department leaders. And so the expectations were that I was going to succeed. And I, I knew that I was in a very good position. And I simply didn't want to disappoint my boss. I didn't want to disappoint my uh, department chair, I didn't want to disappoint a man. And because that was very much ingrained in our culture, the way we were brought up as little girls. Mm -hmm. And I carried that through. I learned how to do it from other women, but I clearly knew how to play the game and what I needed to do. I think, Carolyn, not only was the culture different in different schools and departments at Stanford, but the disciplinary cultures were so different nationally and internationally. Mm -hmm. So I think Helen and I represent two disciplines, <laughs> physics and economics, that were particularly mm -hmm. hostile to women. I would add philosophy as a third. And um, you know, it was just hard to have entered those fields. And what happened at Stanford kind of mirrored what was going on uh, nationally and internationally. Mm. Yeah. Linguistics always had a lot of women. But I've, ever since we talked about this session today, I've been thinking about ways in which women got marginalized. I don't think I necessarily realized it in the 70s. But looking back, what I remember is there was a very, very distinguished woman Indo-Europeanist 
And nobody could ever have any conversation about her without commenting about her hats, because she liked to wear <laughs> different <laughs> kinds of hats. So you either were comment on, evaluated on what you looked like or what you wore, or the way you behaved. So either you were kind of silly because you had hats or shoes or whatever, or you were aggressive. And that was it. It was a very, very strong evaluation, even in a field which had a lot of women in it. And in face-to-face -face yeah. conversation, too, one of the things I was remembering was that many, many times I, I would find myself having a friendly conversation with a faculty member. And then I would realize that what he was talking about had to do with women. So that w when they look at me, they see women. <laughs> women. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just oh, learned to live with that. But um, yeah. you know, I, I, I came to realize that I was, I was a novelty. You know, I, I was a kind of curiosity. And that was pretty benign, but it was, all, it was always there. But I think your comment that you learned to live with it um, suggests perhaps that you also learned to ignore it. And um, I think maybe we all, um, we all did. did. Yes. Um, I remember recently Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that she took advice from her mother-in-law who told her that sometimes it was good to be a little bit deaf and not pay attention to every slight that um, one experiences. And so, you know. You had to not take it seriously. Well, I think that's the most important message in mentorship. I agree Actually. with that, Elizabeth. Yes, I, that's, a, that's a lesson that I tell mentees and students, you need to develop thick skin. Mm -hmm. You just can't let these things get under your skin. You just have to listen, stay focused, and keep on your track. And I think one of the things that's happened in recent decades is so many people talk about being victims of this or that or the other. That is very hard for younger women in particular and I to think, yeah, be deaf at the right moments. <laughs> and, and I think that was part of feminism at, at the time back then was, you know, a lot of people felt that it was important not to take slights. And you have to, you, you know, you have to come up with your own strategy, but at least sometimes you have to just laugh or turn, turn deaf. I had a colleague at the business school whose office was two doors down from mine, and every time he saw me, he commented on what I was wearing, mm. usually very favorably. Uh -huh. And I had That's one good. woman student who heard this one time, and she said to me afterwards, how could you let that go? And I said, you don't understand. <laughs> That's really minor compared to other things that <laughs> um, yeah. I'm dealing yes. with. Yeah. So. All right, let's move to um, the factors that helped us. Uh, you mentioned some of them, Carolyn, in mm -hmm. terms of the um, graduate students and the women's secretaries. What else was happening at Stanford when we arrived and when we were assistant professors or not quite assistant professors <laughs> <laughs> um, that helped us? Any university people, practices, policies that were helpful for us? You know, one of the things was that women across departments banded together, and I think and 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 Crow was a big part of that. Bringing it's it's the Center for Research on Women, but it brought together women scholars, whether they were doing research on women or not. It w it was a nexus point for for bringing women together, and I think that was tremendously important. Even though we were small in numbers, we we could find each other. And the person who was so helpful with that was Jing Lyman. Absolutely. The wife of Stanford's president, uh, Richard Lyman. Um, talk about her a little bit, <laughs> about Jing. <laughs> uh, I first met Jing Lyman on, uh, at the American Historical Association in, in December of 1973 when I was on a panel on women's history. 
and um, I got to the up to the up to the the platform, and I looked in the front row, and there was a woman knitting. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, to some feminist at this, this time, that would have been just anathema. <laughs> and a woman knitting. And I looked at the man next to her, and he had on a name ta tag, and it said Richard Lyman, president of the university. And I was a brand new assistant professor. And she had, she had brought Dick, who had no real interest in women's history. <laughs> to this session to support us. And she was, she was the, one of the strongest women I've ever known, I think. She was one of these Yankee women who was a very strong personality, very strong values that she, that she devoted herself to. And one of those values was the advancement of professional women. She worked on that a lot, and she was just a personality. Um, but it was very important to have a personality like that where, where she was located. Though she had no formal position in, in the university, she was a force in the university. She Absolutely. really helped me to get Crow started. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Because um, she uh, called me and said she wanted to help. And uh, I had coffee with her. And she said she wanted to put together a group of wealthy women whom she knew from her fundraising mm -hmm. for the university who she thought might be interested in supporting Crow. And at that point, our budget from the university was so small that having <laughs> funds from wealthy women was really helpful. And she was just a supporter all throughout her life. And your knitting image resonates with me. Whenever she came to a meeting, she was knitting. She made the most fabulous sweaters for all of her friends and relatives and so on. It's interesting. I think I'm right in saying that there was something named for Jing on campus before there was something named for Dick. Yes, because Crow named the Jing Lyman Lecture Series yes. Yes. Uh, before, while well Jing known. was still alive. Yes. Yes, and, and that okay. was really good. But also, um, Dick Lyman himself, having been educated by his wife, and the provost at the time, Bill Miller, was very, very supportive. Yes, both of them were. Um, I remember going to see Bill Miller um, about childcare at Stanford, because there was no childcare at Stanford except a cooperative child care, which mm -hmm. wasn't really very helpful for faculty because you didn't have time to be time to be cooperative. And um, Bill heard that, and he really started to um, support financially um, uh, child care at Stanford. So that was very helpful, too. I, I should finish my story about the uh, American Historical Association in 1973. Soon afterwards, I received a letter in the mail from Dick Lyman oh. saying that he wasn't certain that he would have handled that situation as gracefully as I did when he was an assistant professor. But it was just a wonderfully thoughtful thing for him to give me that, that feedback. Wow. What a nice so compliment. It, he, he, was a, he was a historian, so he was close to the department and what was going on there. But he, 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 he was a nice person, good person. Yeah, in my case, the, my mentors were men. Yeah, mm -hmm. mine too. I mean, uh, Slack was a long way from campus in the sense of any community with faculty on campus. As a staff member at Slack, I had no presence on campus. Occasionally, I taught a course in the physics department, sort of voluntarily choosing to do some teaching. But aside from that, I lived at Slack. And Slack was essentially a male community, aside from, as you said, the secretarial staff, the support staff that were women in those years. So it was the support of some men who allowed me to, to survive, to help me, to move me forward. And I would mention particularly Sid Drell, who was the head of the theory mm. group and who always was supportive of my career. He became even more supportive once he realized his daughter was going to become yeah. a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think that that point brings up that effective mentoring is not gender specific. It's right. just somebody who cares. And when we didn't have a lot of women mentors because there weren't a lot of women, but 
each one of us have had a story about a powerful male or males mm -hmm. who helped us along our way. And just like with Dick and Jing Lyman, many of these powerful uh, leaders at Stanford had very strong wives. And in my department, Henry Kaplan made, married to Leah Kaplan, Mal Bagshaw married to Muriel Bagshaw, and both Lee Kaplan and Muriel Bagshaw had their very strong careers and professional lives and certainly had influence over their husbands. And I've, I've certainly profited from, from their sensitivity about women's issues. They were sensitive to their own wives. I think you need to have someone in a leadership position to say that it's important mm -hmm. to have women. Mm -hmm. And my first experience with Tom Mosher in the English department, mm -hmm. uh, recently I went to a memorial of his, and person after person said that he had been a mentor to them as a woman, and that was certainly my experience. And then later, Al Hasdorf was very instrumental in getting me and some other women together to, on a committee that was looking into the status of uh, women in the humanities. And actually, we all went around to different departments promoting hiring of senior women. So our job was to go to the departments and persuade them that it would be valuable to hire a senior woman. Now, how do you do that? You can only do it if you get a slot and a billet. <laughs> so you have to have someone in the administration who's willing to put some funds right. behind put that activity. Right. And uh, it was very interesting going to the different departments and mm -hmm get a lot of polite listening and some rather paternalistic, uh, oh, well, thank you, uh, go away, <laughs> sort of uh, attitudes. And then later on, um, John Hennessy, when he was provost. And I, this is jumping forward many, many, many years. Uh, he had been in engineering and been very instrumental in getting women hired mm -hmm. in engineering. And to have someone from engineering, a very male field, uh, in the provost's office saying, this is important to hire women. I think that was a later, maybe two decades later. Mm -hmm. But one needs to continue the conversation. One conversation is not enough. In the department, it isn't enough. You have to have the university <laughs> also yeah. mm -hmm. having that conversation, starting the conversation, saying it's important. I want to go into a little bit more detail about the factors that um, hindered your acceptance and advancement. So Helen, you had lots of factors going on. Well, <laughs> as I say, my acceptance and advancement as a physicist in my career were not hindered by the fact that right. I was not a faculty member. I had a full-time research job, and I could work on what I chose to work on. Mm -hmm. I had the flexibility that a faculty member would have in research. And so uh, on the one side, I had a very ideal situation to make my career mm -hmm. in research. On the other, I had no status in the university, per se. And those two things were just parallel things that were happening. So you described how once you were a staff person, every time a billet came up, they thought they could um, do better in terms of getting another person. And there weren't that many billets, right? Slack has a relatively small faculty, and the number of theoretical physicists hired during the time I was there was few, were few. But yet yeah, they definitely were not really seriously considering me in any of those hires. And I think it was simply, you know, she's here, and she's not going away. And it would be better for the department as a whole to bring in somebody new. So it's very interesting. You know, I'm an economist who studies discrimination. And so I would make a distinction, in your case, between discrimination on the part of the people who were hiring, you know, in terms of the, the micro situation mm -hmm. versus the larger societal factors which got you to be in that position to begin with. So yes. I think that has to do with work and family and so on. 
And some of it had to do with that, too, because then I did go through a period in my career where my son was sick for three years. Mm -hmm. And I had to pull back to half time to be able to care for him. And that uh, definitely then really took some effort to re-enter and re-establish myself mm -hmm. professionally mm -hmm. after that period where I wasn't fully active in my career. Mm -hmm. and so that affected decisions too, probably. Mm -hmm. But all, what I did was just moved ahead where I could move ahead and found roles I could play where I did become a leader in various activities and in externally, as I said, as you mentioned, I was elected to the National Society for Physics, the American Physical Society, to be president. I was actually the third woman, woman in 100 years of history in that position, and the second woman was the president immediately before me, so that was a strange situation to have two of us in a row. But uh, that kind of surprised the people in my department, or the people at Slack, that I had that prominence outside of the lab, mm -hmm. that, that enough of the field would recognize me to elect me. Mm -hmm. So it, it was clear, clear that I had a different level of reputation internally and externally. And when they finally got around to making it legal and giving you the a position you deserved? Well, that, I, became, I was elected to the National Academy. And before that election was publicly announced, of course, the, the members of the Academy here at Stanford knew that. And so at that point, I think Hennessy then president of the university said this is kind of odd to have somebody who's not a faculty member elected what to the National that Academy. Now? That was 2004. Mm -hmm. And so 2003 I was elected, 2004 I officially became faculty. So they started the appointment process once they realized I was elected to the National Academy. And the, that was what was called a rubber band bill, billet which means Slack was being given an additional billet, or possibly two, because there were two other women also who were reconsidered, and one of them was made a research faculty at that time, too, because Slack had had quite a few women staff scientists and no, no women faculty up to that point. And so it was an intervention of the president of the university that made Slack relook at that situation. So did you get a salary increase? Absolutely. It was a more than 50% salary increase. Wow. And the director of the lab <laughs> said to me, uh, this is not the difference between a staff salary and a faculty salary. You have been being underpaid for years. So I know that's true. It never had occurred to me to ask what my salary was in comparison to others. And uh, clearly, for some years, I was on the low end of the scale. It's good you're not an economist, otherwise you would focus on how much lower your uh, pension is. Uh, I, I have <laughs> thought of that, but what can you do? There's nothing to There's correct There's nothing it. to do. There's Helen, no way to correct it. So Helen, your mention of your son's illness and how you pulled back temporarily brings up the issue of the difference it makes when you as a woman also have a family. Right. And uh, you know, one of the uncertainties is it doesn't matter how supportive your husband is or how equal the household is. If something, if a need arises, such as a child's illness, it's going to be you who probably pull back. Not yes. Probably, necessarily. not necessarily, yeah. and probably less and less. Yes. But um, that was, you know, one of my uncertainties in 1973 because I uprooted the whole family. My husband gave up his job. We moved out here, as I've already indicated, mm -hmm. blind. I didn't know this department or this area. I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, and so the, the family decision making is something that's going on alongside and intertwined with the, the professional decision making. And I, for one, always felt and I probably didn't need to, but I felt that I needed to, I didn't hide it. They all knew I had children and family responsibilities, but I could never let it appear that those were in, infringing on my fulfillment of my professional responsibilities. And that was another kind of 
tension for me. And now that we have enough women in the department, I love it when these women come in pregnant and then they come in with their babies. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's just a whole different situation. I think what some things have changed in terms of professional women and with families and, and, and some indeed have not. But it's an interesting change which probably Myra knows quite a lot about in terms of research on families. Yeah, well, I always felt inadequate because I had a child, I had a husband, I had my job, and my husband lived in Berkeley, and I drove here 40 miles each time. So long and commute. so I had very little social contact here and very little social contact there. And very I little time for anything social. Anything. <laughs> right. uh, That's a big so thing. So I always time. thought I wasn't doing the 100 or 110 percent mm -hmm. of my job that I should be doing. So there's always a little bit of sense of guilt for the family and mm -hmm. a bit guilt for my <laughs> Both job. ways, right. Both ways. Both ways. Both ways. Yes. And being able to switch back and forth. Both, yes. Being able to be a parent when you were a parent and be a researcher Absolutely. when you were a researcher yeah. and not let the worries about the other interfere you with the work you were doing nimble. at this moment. Very, very nimble. I don't think that's gone away, but I think no. there's a conversation about it and there's a much there's better a network about, about it. it. Work-life balance is a huge yeah. issue right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, but when we were living that portion of our lives, it, it, wasn't it, was, it fell to the woman to, to sacrifice for whatever it was, child to make care. It work. Or, yeah. it, it, no matter who your partner it was, it, it was yeah. the yes. expectation was that the woman would in. Well, and having a supportive partner was very important and made it workable. You couldn't do it without yes. that. Mm -hmm. But still, there were many times, I think you're right, Caroline, where I felt, you know, as a mother, I had to be there for this kid at that mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that was just not a choice. It was something that had to happen. And there was so much uh, social expectation about women's roles when you stepped off campus. For example, when we moved here and I went over to the elementary school to check whether my children could have lunch on campus, you know, at, at the school, and the principal said, well, we try to be responsive when there's a social problem in the home. And <laughs> I said, I'm a social problem in the home? You know, and the neighbors would come over and say, well, welcome to the neighborhood. What brought you here? And I said, well, I, I'm a I have a professorship at Stanford. No, no, I mean your husband. And so there was always, even down the road, there was this expectation that, you know, that if the woman did something, it was on the side or, you know, it was secondary. I have a funny story about that. Um, my children were at Nixon Elementary School uh, right here on campus. and. Um, one of my daughter's friend's mother asked me if she could put me down as a secondary emergency contact. So she was the primary contact, her husband was the second contact, and I was the third contact. So I got a call one morning from the school uh, asking if I would come and pick up Sarah. She was not feeling well, and uh, could, I, could I come? And I said, oh, and, and Sarah's mother was unreachable. They couldn't reach her. I said, well, did you try Sarah's father? And the secretary said, oh, no, he's at work. Oh. <laughs> and I said, well, so I'm I. at work, too. <laughs> and maybe Sarah would like to see her father if she's not feeling well. Rather, than This was an eye-opener for the school secretary. Yeah. Well, don't you think, really, that to compete in a man's world, which was the task that we had when we were entering, that there was an expectation that women have to do the job but be better. So you had to, you, you had to be better than most people because you had to succeed in your job, in your, you know, your academic job, and you certainly had to succeed as a wife and a mother. So it was, it was a heavy assignment and it was a stressful assignment and women had to learn to prioritize and be resourceful and be flexible and multitask and all of those things that you're all masters at. So, Carolyn, you mentioned social situations, <laughs> and um, I think we all have funny stories about social situations. Um. Well, yes. 
uh, I had a lot to learn. And I started learning it pretty quickly when colleagues uh, would have dinner parties. And I had not anticipated this, but I walked in and you know, they, they, the men weren't smoking cigars, but they were standing by the fireplace and there were no women in sight and the women were in the kitchen. And I had to make a decision, what, you know, where did I belong? And we all faced that one. And I decided I belonged with my colleagues. We, that's why we were there. And so my husband and I both, you know, joined the, the colleagues. But there were many little things like that that there were no there were no guidelines for and you had to decide sometimes right on the spot for the first time and and then live with it and that and that's my memory is is the is the is the dinner parties and where did i belong which was a, you know that, which that which limited limited question. your inclusion in the social group in some way because you weren't part of the women's Group, at least I always no, felt that's right. I was not as much part of the community as other couples were who were more normal yes. in the way they broke down yeah. in, in that situation. And there was a real cost to that because yeah. you were kind of, in a way, an outsider to both groups. And it's, I always felt I was a little bit of an outsider here because I had a family and a little bit of an outsider in the neighborhood because I had a a job. You know, a job. So uh, that was another thing that you really have to negotiate your own satisfaction with. I tried to play it both ways. So I would spend part of the early evening with the women in the kitchen, and then I'd come out and be with my colleagues. Uh, my husband, of course, never went into the kitchen no. to um, be with the Mine women. Did. He did. <laughs> he would join the women. <laughs> he said, Bev, you're all talking physics. I'm going to go talk to the women. But I knew many Even of the women. PhD in physics. Uh, I knew many of the women because their children were in school with my children, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. I wanted those contacts, mm -hmm. um, in addition to the professional ones. But it was always a struggle, uh, and awkward. Uh, which way? Did you face that at all, Sarah? Yes, I have a different spin on this. It's just making me sort of smile on the inside <laughs> because it's the same story, but it's slightly different. It's not limited to Stanford, and that's it. When when I became an officer and a trustee of the American Board of Radiology, which was quite a high, a lofty position in radiology circles, every year we had a retreat. And at the retreat, uh, the new trustee didn't know all the other people that were the existing people. And there was a tradition that people, the trustees would all go out to dinner together. The first year I was a trustee, up until the seventh year, six years in a row, no one invited me to go to dinner with them. Wow. No one invited me. When I became president of the ABR, I initiated a new policy, just the same as you would if you were having a dinner party in your home. I put place cards out. And so we'd, I'd have organized a dinner, made little place cards, and I'd put the physicist next to the biologist, next to the wife of the <laughs> clinician, next, you know, and I just scattered everybody around. And it was an absolute icebreaker. And that's continued since then. Mm -hmm. But that was a feminist kind of a thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who ever heard of going to an ABR trustees meeting and have place cards for dinner? I mean, it was unheard of. So there's an unusual example of how women change their fields because the conversations that happened at that dinner probably would never have happened otherwise. Well, I think we networked differently, so we all got to know each other. So we mm -hmm. weren't little subsets or little cells of a group, but there was much greater camaraderie between each of the subspecialists, the biologists and the physicists and the clinicians and the this is and the Instead that. Instead of being subgroups, they were a group. Yeah, yeah, it was a very good icebreaker and it's continued. How about at faculty meetings? What was the dynamic like there in terms of being heard and not being heard? And Sarah, you had an interesting story about that. Um, Do you want to remind me what it? Well, you said that um, sometimes you uh, said something on purpose, knowing that it was not going to be picked up because you said it, oh. but you wanted some male colleague to repeat it and then get heard. <laughs> That's well, good. I think that's, um, that's an approach that women learn to exercise. That's a, maybe it's intuitive or innate in feminism. I'm not certain about that. But 
it became very clear to me that the way to get a task done was um, inclusivity and not exclusivity. And the more participants, the more people that were on your team, the quicker you could get to the end. And so if it was an idea that was perhaps not going to be immediately accepted, if you could create the scene so that your colleague or your boss or your male co comrade had the idea, <laughs> then you could support it and, and you could help get it done. And it, I mean, the end result was it didn't matter who got the credit for it. It mattered that you got the task done. And I think that, that's, that women learn very quickly that it doesn't matter how you get things done. You need to get it done. I mean, that's... But I don't think we thought. all had the experience of <laughs> saying something not being heard, and then the man will pick it up it. and... Sure. Uh, it's I mean, his they, project. Yeah, they invent, they, they in, they invent the idea. Reinvent your idea. idea. It's, yeah, yeah, that's they, okay. They reinvent your idea, and you have to get used to that. And uh, I, as you say, you, you strategize it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. I don't think I had that problem. And I give credit to the fact that I grew up with three brothers and a father who liked to foment arguments at the family table and have us all take our part. And so I was used to arguing with the boys. And so somehow I learned early on how to make my voice heard in a male group and never had to say, somebody else say this for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Interesting. My experience with young feminists today um, is that they would not buy your strategy, that they would insist upon um, being given credit for their ideas. And um, you know, your, your strategy really is, I would think, a communal strategy. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're looking mm -hmm. out for the good of whatever entity it is that's meaning, and you're less concerned with how much credit you get. But I think so many young women, having been denied credit all along, are, are not accepting that idea. And I think that you're, you may be very right about that, because for me, it wasn't tooting my horn. There was no self-grandizement about it. it, it wasn't, that wasn't the issue. And maybe it was because I was in a supportive environment. And I, the, the glass ceiling situation, well, there is a glass ceiling. and. We, you know, we see it all the time because there are fewer people in leadership. But for me, along my trajectory in my career, when I would start reach level, there was another door that opened and another door. So for me, it was always opportunities. And it, didn't, it, didn't, it wasn't important to me to ask for the credit. It was important to just focus on what the mission was, finding the cure for cancer or improving somebody's treatment or... or you know, whatever the issue was, that's what I focused on. Mm -hmm. I was maybe, busy doing that. <laughs> it took all my energies. <laughs> maybe because your profession is more toward, you know, improving humanity rather than <laughs> ours, which are more scholarly, uh, you get sure. to something like sure. that. I mean, that, and that's very much the nursing background, this caring and missionary kind of helping other people. That was very much ingrained in in the way I practice medicine from the very beginning. I'm sure because of my nursing background. So your work now uh, in, in, education. in education perhaps is more like Sarah's earlier uh, stories. Um. In a sense, I mean, uh, clearly I made a choice at the time I retired to make a change and not to continue doing physics research, which most re retired physicists do, but to move to this opportunity I had to take the leadership in the new science standards and the work around them. And that's much more work in service of a community. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't feel at all Im it's important that I get recognition for any part mm -hmm. of that work. I feel it's important that it happened. So I can kind of understand where you are in, in, in that position of saying, you know, if, if I can figure out ways to make this happen, it doesn't matter where the credit falls. Mm -hmm. So that, that, I think, the, the reward is in the fact that a lot of kids are going to learn science better. Mm -hmm. Are you dealing with the fact that there are um, a dearth of women in, in some of the sciences, physics, chemistry, and so on? 
I think that is something that will follow, right? There's, there's a dearth of women and an even greater dearth of minorities mm -hmm. going into these fields. And it's partly because of the way they have been taught, mm -hmm. which is a way that tends to discourage women from entering them. Mm -hmm. And I think if we change the way we teach them, we will also change the flow of women into them. Do you all feel that there's been a glass ceiling at Stanford in terms of women in leadership positions? And some of you have had some very important leadership positions. How, how did you come by them? And what's your view on the glass ceiling at Stanford? Well, let me say, <clears throat> although I, from my understanding, I probably had the position that was quotes the highest one because I was vice provost <laughs> uh, and dean of graduate studies. I do think there's a glass ceiling. Uh, I think I got the position partly because I was a woman. I really do. That's what I think of as the sort of second phase of affirmative action, the affirmative action of continuing on doing something for women. And if I may sort of backtrack on that, uh, there was a Fa faculty Senate meeting at which Al Hasdorf asked me why it was that I had raised the question why in all the affirmative action reports that we got, we never got any information about women's success in leadership. And he asked me, well, why do you care? And I was a little taken aback, and several women came up to me afterwards and said, what a terrible question that was. But I realized he wanted it actually put in, in writing, in the record, why anybody would care. And I said, well, you know, there are very few women who are chairs of departments. There are fewer who are in any dean kind of jobs, and so forth. So back to your question. I do think that there is a, a leadership problem. That there we is are one of the few bit. major research universities in our group that um, has not had a woman um, a president. Exactly. Um, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Yale. Mm -hmm. so. All relatively recently. All relatively All recently. recently. Yeah. Yeah. But Penn certainly the data there. in education and academic institutions demonstrate that there still is a glass ceiling. There is. Great headway has been made. But if you just look at the percentage of women presidents or deans or then department chairs or division chairs or tenured professors or full professors or incoming students, et cetera, it's the Which percentages. Which you would expect, right? As, yeah. as time goes on, the numbers should go up. And they are going up. Yes, but, but they're, they're, they're totally going up uh, proportionate to the level below or not. And that's the question. The glass ceiling is if the people who've gotten to the stage of being full professors now meet a ceiling where they're less likely to move to the next stage. And I think that has been the case. Whether it is today the case, it's hard to say. Yeah. I'm a little out of touch, too. But let me tell you what my experience was going from faculty position in the history department, which I have already described as fairly non-competitive uh, and, and supportive to administration, which I found to be culturally completely different. And I think one of the problems is, uh, or one of the uh, descriptors of the, uh, the administrative culture is that it's a very steep pyramid. You know, there are very few places at the top. And that makes it very competitive uh, in a way that I, I never saw a competition in the department. And secondly, I found there was a really high degree of male bonding in, um, among the administrators, which I had also found to be less strong in the department and certainly uh, less difficult to break into. And which made it much easier to criticize a woman who had fewer links in the, in the male bonding uh, to give more incentive to be critical because people were jockeying for a position and, and jockeying for the benefits to their department, you know, on the part of uh, department chairs. 
And my finding was that when there came to be when it came to be between a male who was doing a poor job and a woman who was doing a very good job, it was too difficult to do away with the man, to take the man out of the position. It was just too difficult because of what I, what I, what I understand to be the bonding among people who'd known each other for a very long time. You know, the, the men in administration had known each other for, for decades because they'd worked their way up through the, through the, uh, through the ranks uh, together. So I think both of those things, I think the steepness of the pyramid and the, the, the strong bonding that goes on uh, uh, um, between men are the props of that, of that glass ceiling. At least they were when, you know, 15 years ago when I, when I left administration. How do you think Stanford has changed over the years since we arrived? So we're talking about 40 plus years. Um, wow. In many ways, <laughs> it's, it's a different grown. place. <laughs> it's, it's clearly, clearly grown. grown. There are clearly more buildings. Um, but um, how have you changed? How, how has the treatment of women changed? treatment of women's students changed? And, and what challenges do you see that may have arisen that weren't there when we came? Well, there's clearly more awareness of the issues. Mm -hmm. And we, th have, we thank those women from a tier before us, I think, because they really were the huge pioneers mm -hmm. to that. There's much more awareness. But we cannot be complacent. We are not yeah. there yet. Yeah. We still have lots of work to do. So we need to keep being uh, do, on the same path we are and keep working on these issues because it's not 50-50. And I think in a way it's harder because the, the issues are subtler. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, when we came, the issue of, of hiring, the issue of, of policy to, you know, for family policy and so on, uh, were overt, easily defined, and, and they could be addressed. And what I see now is the, the, issues, are, the issues of discrimination are, are subtle, um, harder to identify, and, and really require a very broad and deep uh, cure not just uh, a, a change of a policy or, you know, it really means a, a broad and deep change in the culture, the broader culture and in people's attitudes before there's going to be the kind of mm -hmm. parity mm -hmm. that we would like to see. Which means broader culture both outside and inside the university. Absolutely. It's not, it, the university cannot evolve outside of the culture it lives in. No, because no. people are born out there <laughs> <laughs> and raised out there. These are slow, uh, slow processes, yes. aren't they? Yeah. One of the biggest differences I see, which really distresses me, is the increase in sexual assault. Mm. And, and I think that, I mean, I, I come back, go back to when I arrived as a student in 1961-62, where I was not allowed to live outside of a dorm with my family off campus without the dean of women interviewing my mother and checking to see that my father was coming back before she gave permission. My father was in South Africa for six months uh, for me to live off campus with my parents. So the university stood in loco parentis to yes. women students and was very, very protective of them. Yes. Excessively so. Yes. So then the pendulum swung the other way and the university, the campus became much more equal in terms of the way male and female students were treated but that raised the risk for female students in certain situations of the problems we're seeing today in terms of sexual assault. And that's not just on the campus, that's also in society in general. Mm -hmm. And so f again, figuring out how to deal with those issues, which are not just issues of sexual assault, but also of excessive alcohol and mm -hmm. behaviors on campus of students, which when they suddenly come from their homes and are treated as adults, in, and expected to make independent decisions about their lives, it's <coughs> something I don't think we've worked out well how to help them through that transition. Mm -hmm. 
It's interesting remembering the parietals. When you mention it to your students that you used to have curfews, you know, 10 at night or 11 at night, <laughs> and all the things that went they with it, it, they can't <laughs> believe it. But I, I wanted to ask Myra, are we certain that the incidence has risen, not just the reporting? The incidence of assault? Of assault. I, I don't know, and I don't know if anybody knows that. But I know that when Gerhard Casper was president, he put in a very effective, I think, uh, sexual harassment or anti-sexual harassment policy. And I was one of the sexual harassment advisors on campus. And the way it worked was, I think, very smart so that faculty, students, staff from any place on campus could come to any advisor. So you didn't have to come to an advisor in your own department or school right. or anything like that. And so I had many women who came to me, we're talking now in the 1990s, um, about with stories of sexual harassment, which were chilling enough. But nobody ever came with a story like of we're assault. seeing now of assault. And so I think, unfortunately, that's one of the new, um, at least in terms of reporting. And what's going on um, you know, in the country in general now with so many women reporting sexual assault by very prominent men, I think we may see more reporting of uh, sexual assault. But I, I think your point is correct, that um, unless this changes in the society as a whole, it's not going to change. Um, on the campus. At, um, on the campus. It's not yeah. unique to Stanford. I mean, right. It's not unique to medicine. Right. It's not unique to academia. So let me ask you, what's one thing that you know now that you wish you'd known earlier in your oh. career? Oh. <laughs> Starting out at 25 or 30 with oh, the wisdom boy. of 70 or 75. I think how hard it is to be an academic. I don't think any student ever see, ever can see, though they sit in the classroom for years, what goes into the work of, of their faculty. It's just uh, the, the leap from, from being a student to being a faculty member and then lasting through your whole life. It's just an all-consuming job. And my mother, bless her heart, uh, would always say, "Well, what are you, you know, what are you going to do this summer? You've got the summer off." <laughs> I said, "Never had a summer off. I do my research in the summer. The, nobody knows until they get into it what a demanding job it is." You know, I, I think that's really important because people think, "Well, you've got these long vacations." <laughs> three months in the summer. Who has three months in the summer? You're supposed to work, Absolutely. but it's. Not in the classroom or in the lab or, well, maybe it is in nobody the medical school. Nobody sees it. But I, you, nobody sees it. Would you have made the decision to become a professor if you'd known then what you know now? I think so. I think so. I was pretty driven uh, to do it. But um, I, I do wish that when I finished my or as getting to the end of my PhD, that I'd had a little bit of advice from somebody about what I might be well, encountering, <laughs> yes, and, and what I, decisions I would need to make and, and ways of dealing with, with the challenges. And there was just, there was none. Now, one of my major mentorships with the grant p finishing yes. PhDs yes. is you've got to be able to multitask. You've got to think about teaching, research, and committee work, and life. Yes. <laughs> and life shouldn't just be on the side. So there are four things at least, I mean, there may be more, but <laughs> start with that. And they say, well, I'm, this is so hard, what I'm doing now. I said, nothing, 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 I'm <laughs> no. coaching. What is yes. going to be later? It's true. Uh, yeah. You have to give good. things up. I mean, yeah, there are yeah, things you can't un until you retire, and then you can pick them up again. But um, there, you have to make you know, there are costs. Yeah. Yeah. I think what Caroline said earlier about the imposter syndrome, I think that it would be nice for young people to know that they're not the only one who struggles, and they're not the only one who thinks, maybe I shouldn't be trying this. You know, the, the confidence that 
we all have now is something we fought for. And a little bit of that confidence earlier on would have been helpful, I think. So knowing that, that you're as capable as anybody else yes. going into this would be helpful. What I thought of was, I wish I'd known that I didn't have to be perfect at everything. Mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I do now know, but. Would I have uh, again? Would I? Absolutely. Because really when, you're, when you look back on where, where you were, where you are, and the journey you took, and the trajectory, nothing is as gratifying as, as watching the success of your trainees, of your students, in my case of my patients. And there's nothing better in life. So would I do it all over again? Absolutely. No regrets. I feel the same way. Yeah, I think so, um, too. Yeah. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Um, but I also agree with Carolyn. It would have been nice to know at the beginning how hard it was going to be. Um, yeah. Yes, we all wish that. But think of our mothers and our mothers' mothers. They had it hard, too. It was different. And they had a lot of frustrations that we don't have. In many ways, we're privileged, aren't we, yeah. to have had this wonderful environment that we have and so much fun to get up in the morning and, and do what we do. True enough. Like Anybody want to say anything else? Well, it's just been a pleasure talking to you, my colleagues, Thank you. Uh, today. And um, we hope that those listening will have enjoyed what we had to say. And we hope that the university is even more egalitarian in years to come. Thank you.